Yes. We're going to go to the NCBI and I'm going to get the H5N8. So what I'm looking at is any type, uh, so type A, any host, any region. I want the HA, I want, I've clicked onto protein coding region here. I want H5 and I want N8. I want full length only, that is going to still give me a load of junk because it always does. And I want it to show me the results. It's got 188. Now, I didn't think about that very carefully. So let's go back again. So I'm gonna create a phylogenetic tree. So the first thing you need to think about when you're creating a tree is, uh, Remember, I just showed you one of humans and I showed you of chimpanzees and bonobos. So what you have to have is a distance between things to put things on a tree. So if I have two sequences which have exactly the same sequence, how am I going to be able to put them on a tree with any kind of branch or difference between them? They are exactly the same sequence, so they fall in the same place on the tree. So let's go back and do that search again and click off uh, collapse identical sequences click that on because there's no point in getting the same sequence twice for the methods we're going to use today if you're using the method that i says I said allows you to look at the time of collection and to build that into the tree then you can take identical sequences because even if they're identical, they're going to be, have been collected in different places on different days. So this allows you to look at how fast it's mutating and how fast it's moving around. Right, so collapse identical sequences to results. Before we had 188, now we've got 119. Have a little look down here at the lengths. This one's short. This one's short. This one's short, this one's short, this one's short, this one's short. They're short, but not by a massive amount. Are they short by a sensible amount is the question. Not really. 1,701 is a sensible amount. It's three bases shorter than the others. 1,695 is not, oh, okay, it's fine. It is nine shorter, so that's good. One of them's lost three. I mean, I said the other one's lost one. We can cope with that. All good. So I want to get all those sequences. I don't want the protein faster because I've searched for the coding region. So I want to download the coding region. Download. Go to my downloads. Rename the file. Something sensible because that's just rubbish. 2021, second, 15, and CBI, HA. Uh, it's the coding region and it's H5N8. And I'll call that up fast so I know what it is and so that Maker will pick it up automatically. Mm -hmm. Anything else I need to do? Nope. So I can just open that with NC with uh, Mega and do the alignment. If I go to here, go to align. I can do alignment by codons because that is from a start codon to a stop codon. Uh, and it will do the alignment much faster than doing the standard muscle alignment. If I'd have picked the segment, then I can get, what the heck is this thing? Okay, it's just because it's got a truncation. And there's some others as well. That one looks like it's longer than the others. Mm. Okay, that's fine. Most of them are pretty much the same, but there are a few stark differences. If you get 
instead of the coding region, you get the entire segment, you will get some stuff that is in front of the start codon. And the start codon you should always recognize is ATG. You should also recognize some of the stop codons. So TAG and TAA are two of them. I'm trying to see if there's any others in here that I used. TAG. Okay, that's fine. So when they're doing sequencing, if they do the segment, Sometimes they get absolutely every part of the nucleotides and sometimes they miss some bits. So usually if you get the entire segment, it's still worth trimming it to the start and stop codon because otherwise you're going to get sort of jagged edges, which are not dependent on what's actually happening in the virus. They're dependent on how good the sequencing was. And you don't want experimental errors to make a difference to your results. You want it to be in the biology, not in the process of collection. So let's do alignment, codons, nothing to align, select all of them, go OK. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'd like to remove caps, but there shouldn't be any. I don't really think there should be any. That was quick. So I have a completely aligned set of sequences. You can see that the bulk of them are all identical to each other, but occasionally you've got these ones which are very different to the others. Uh, so this is one from Colorado in 2006. This one is from Ireland in 1983. This one is from Thailand in 2012. Um, I'm trying to find the bit that's most different. So let's go and find the bit which has all those gaps. These gaps. It's a mess here. Complete mess. So the ones that are truncated out, this one's from Bulgaria, this one's from Maryland, this one's from California, California, New Jersey. California, uh, no, actually that's not California, two from Ireland, Thailand, Ireland. So Ireland seems to be three shorter and the American ones seem to be that nine shorter. So there's something happening between America and everywhere else and between Ireland and everywhere else. Now Ireland, is where H5NH was first detected in, was it 1983? Then it disappeared for a large period of time. Yes, 1983 in a duck. And this is very different to the sequences around it. Right. So I've just discussed that these, there's a group of sequences that are different to each other. So there's the American ones, the Irish ones, and then all the rest of them. So what I should be able to do is construct a tree which separates the Amer some of the American ones from the Irish ones from all the rest of the, them that are almost identical to each other. So I need to construct a phylogenetic analysis. Now to do that, you click on data in Mega when you've got an alignment created and you click on phylogenetic analysis. Uh, it asks you if that protein coding sequence, in this case, yes, it doesn't have to be. You can answer no if you want to. When you did that, it added some things over here. Now, the first thing is a nice browser kind of agent thing that you can do, which you can click on. So what this does is it finds a consensus sequence and then it hides everything but the differences. That's one thing I hate about Mega is going between the different windows. Right, 
So it hides, it creates a consensus and then hides everything from that. So ATG, all of them have the same. So it's just a big pile of dots, nothing particularly interesting. It's chosen at this position to choose an A, but that wasn't actually a very clever idea because it's G in more of the sequences than it's A. So this is not a consensus sequence. It just happens to be a reference sequence that Eddie picked. The consensus sequence is the sequence which has the most common one of each of the nucleotides in each of those separate positions, in each of those positions. So here's most commonly A, because it's always A, and T and G. Then G, and A, and now sometimes that G is replaced with an A, but very rarely. So G happens to be the consensus in that position. Now, you have to remember that the consensus sequence might not correspond to any actual sequence found in nature. So the average might not represent anything of reality. So as I said here, it's picked an A, but G is more common. But if I substituted that A for a G, that's then creating a sequence which needn't occur in nature because of the changes in all the other different other positions. Right, if I go across, I can see highlighted the important changes and I can start to see patterns. So what happens in phylogenetic analysis is it ignores all the columns which are absolutely identical because there's no point in looking at them. They don't tell you about any evolutionary difference between your sequences. It just goes and focuses on the ones where there are big changes. So the first things that's making a difference is C to T, G to A, and the one that we had before, which was another A to G. So it focuses on those to divide your data into multiple groups. And then it keeps dividing things until it ends up creating a tree of all their re relationships to one another. Now, there are lots of different ways of calculating trees with lots of different evolutionary models and different ways of scoring those differences. So I'm just going to use a simple one. I'm going to shrink that down. So once you've got some data in uh, Mega for it to do the phylogenetic analysis on, you can pick one of the methods. So in phylogeny, within MEGA, you can choose to do maximum likelihood tree, a neighborhood joining tree, a minimum evolution tree, a clustering, which is called a, a UPGMA tree, or you can do a maximum parsimony tree. Now, sometimes those methods work, and sometimes those methods collapse in misery for some unknown reason. Mega is a bit unstable for doing these kind of things. So the two trees that generally perform and don't crash and burn and die are maximum likelihood and UPGMA. Now UPGMA, I'm going to demonstrate in the classes how it works because it's easy to show how it works. But that does not mean it is a good program or a good algorithm for creating trees. You should not use it, if at all possible. You want to use the method which is called maximum likelihood. So that's what I'm going to do now. So when I click on maximum likelihood, it asks me, do you want to use the file that you've enabled already? And the answer is yes, please, because otherwise what other data do I want? So then it will open a box with a load of parameters. Now this is where uh, constructing trees gets complicated, I suppose. Not necessarily complicated. It's just there's a lot of parameters and depending on how you set them, you're going to get different results. So you're going to use maximum likelihood. Whenever you produce a tree, you need to test whether that tree is any good or not. So you use something called the bootstrap. Uh, this will basically repeat the process of creating a tree multiple times. People who don't understand what the bootstrap is believe that if you increase this to a massively large number, you will get a more reliable tree. 
if they actually read the textbook by the person who invented the bootstrap, they would understand that that is not true. It was often said that the number of bootstraps should be the number of sequences you put into that alignment. So what do we have? A hundred and something. <coughs> In reality, the number of bootstraps you need to get a reliable tree is dependent on the square root of the number of sequences you put in. So if you put in 100, technically you can get away with 10. But I don't think this program allows you to go below 50. It doesn't. So you'll have to stick with 50, even though that's way more than you need for almost any particular case. This is a nucleotide tree. If it was a protein tree, amino acid tree, it would let you know because you'd have different characters. Now, the next thing is where you have to make a decision. This is which model of evolution do you use? Now, Mega was written by Tamura and Ni, and so therefore they use their specific model as the default. But there are lots of other models. The original one from 1968, which is definitely wrong, is Duke's Cantor. If I had a very, very small data set, so I only had about five or six sequences in it, I might have to use Duke's Cantor because otherwise I'll get silly answers. If you want to take into account transitions and transversions, then you use what's called the Kimura two parameter model. It has two parameters because it has different rates of change for purines to purines and pyrimidines to pyrimidines compared to purines to pyrimidines. Uh, a more complicated version of that is Tamura's three parameter, three parameter model. Then if you go to even more uh, complicated models, so also taking into account that they might be asymmetric, so A to T is not the same as T to A, then you're getting to models like Hasegawa Kishino Yano and Tamura Ne. And then the ultimate one has a different probability for each of the different bases changing to each of the different bases, and it is not symmetrical. So the most complicated of all models is called the general time reversible model. You are supposed to actually run the run the tree creation program first using all the models to find out which one gives you the best answer and then run it a final time using whichever one it decided. So let's leave it on Tamura name. Now you can do that within Mega by doing this model thing, which allows you to select which model is best. The problem with that is it's a bit chicken and egg kind of thing because the way you set up your tree generation usually dictates quite a lot how your uh, models perform. So because we pick maximum likelihood, we're going to get a different set of results than if we did minimum evolution. And so that's more important than which of these you pick tomorrow and and whatever else. And the next thing is called rates among sites. Now, you know, absolutely that the first codon and the second codon do not change as fast as the third codon. Uniform rates assumes you've got equal probability in each one of the positions of the three codons. And that's just silly. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is have what's called the gamma correction. Now, as well as gamma correction, there's something else that you put in, which is invariant sites, which means there'll be parts of the alignment which are totally conserved in all the sequences. Now, you can see that there are. So you can take into account invariant sites and mark those as having a probability of zero for changing. And you can do both of these together, gamma distribution with invariant sites. Now, the problem is the more complicated you make this model, the more things it contains to build that model and the more likely you are to overfit a model. And what do I mean by overfitting? 
So when you were at school and you got a set of points of data, you had to fit a straight line through it. So a straight line is fitted based on two things, slope, intercept. But a lot of people just go, well, why can't I connect all the dots together? So in doing that, I'm not just using two pieces of data to build a model. I'm using every single piece of the data to build a model to describe that connecting shape of that line joining the dots together. So the same thing's happening here. I can either create a very basic model, which is like my straight line going through the data, or I can fit one which uses practically every element of the data and makes it more and more complicated. But eventually I fit a curve which is more complicated than the amount of data I have. And that's called overfitting. With 100 and whatever it is sequences, we can probably go to the highest levels, but you'd run model tests to check. Why is the uniform rate there? Because if you have a very low number of sequences, you'd have to use the uniform rate. Uh, down here are some very technical things which you definitely don't want to think about. So nearest neighbor joining interchange and make an initial tree uh, automatically. So we can totally ignore that. Uh, that's nice. I can pick how many threads I want to th run through my computer. And probably I don't want to run seven because I don't think I've got seven uh, core, so it might do bad things to my processor and slow things down. If you know anything about your computing, you can use multiple threads within your computer, within the processor, because it's got so many cores. So you can have each one of the cores doing a separate one of the calculations. So that will make your calculation faster. If you've got quad core, you've got four. If you've got an octa core, you've got eight. So I think most are about six these days, depends on what's going on. Right, so I can press on OK. And so it will now do the process of creating the phylogenetic tree. 